thank you for joining us this morning. My name is Roger Werholtz. We're going to be focusing today on relationships between correctional agencies and community programs. And before I introduce members of the panel, let me tell you how we envision laying this particular workshop out. We want to begin by focusing on a single relationship between one agency and one community-based program. And from there, move to a more macro perspective to look at managing uh, multiple relationships between governmental corrections agencies and community-based programs. But where we would really like to go after a description of those programs and those relationships is to really focus on what it is that's of interest to you so that we might be able to serve as uh, resources to you to deal with any particular problems or issues that you might be encountering uh, as you try and deliver services to this population. And um, this is the second time that we've done this workshop. I think one of the most productive things that we were able to do the first time we went through it was to help people understand what those people were thinking, the folks on the, the other side of the relationship. And if we can help you with that, I think um, we've probably uh, done something that is fairly worthwhile. Before I introduce members of the panel, we'd like to know a, a little bit about who's here in the room today. So if you could, just by raising your hands, tell me how many of you are from state or tribal agencies? And how many from uh, county or um, city government? Uh, from private? or nonprofit or faith-based organizations? Okay. Uh, any researchers here today? Okay. And anybody that I missed? Um, I'm sorry? Federal. Federal. Okay. Very good. Well, thank you for being here. Let me begin by introducing um, Greg Nicholas. Greg and, and his wife, Lisa, who is actually uh, working next door today, are co-founders and CEOs of Christian Heritage, which is a Nebraska nonprofit faith-based organization that's dedicated to serving at-risk children and their families. It was founded in 1980, and Christian Heritage owns six homes for children which operate as professional foster parent homes. The organization has offices in Lincoln, Omaha, and Kearney, and serves 130 children daily in those homes. In 2007, Christian Heritage launched a fatherhood initiative, uh, Destination Dad, which is a multi-phase program uh, that impacts the lives of vulnerable children working with their incarcerated parents. Greg received a bachelor's degree in business administration from the University of Nebraska in 1974, and his wife Lisa received her BA from the University of Nebraska with a major in psychology, and she received an MBA from the University of Nebraska at Lincoln. To Greg's left is Larry Wayne. Larry is the Deputy Director of the Nebraska Department of Correctional Services. He's been with the department since 1975, beginning as a case manager, working his way up through the ranks. He served as warden of two facilities, is that right, Larry? And uh, currently serves as the Deputy Secretary for Programs and Community Services, and he's been in that role for the last nine years. Larry's got a BA in... Uh, sociology and psychology from Cal State Fullerton. And then to my immediate right is Jack Charlier. Jack is the Director of Consulting and Training for the Center for Health and Justice with Treatment Alternatives for Safe Communities in Chicago. Uh, Jack previously was Senior Manager in the Parole Division for nearly six years 
He is an adjunct trainer and has been for over 15 years and also an adjunct criminal justice faculty member and serves on the Institutional Review Board for Criminal Justice at the University of Illinois. In addition to his background in criminal justice, Jack has 20 years experience in grassroots civic engagement. And Jack possesses a master's degree in public administration from Ohio State University. We'll begin with the description of Greg's program. Um, one of the things that I think is important to us, we've heard, even though we're using microphones, that it's sometimes difficult for those in the back to see and hear. If you're having trouble, wave or, or do something so that, uh, that we know that we need to move or speak up or do something to make sure that, uh, that you can hear. Uh, but ultimately, we want to take uh, at least half of the time to be responsive to particular issues that you may have. So we're really going to ask you to engage with us during this session. So Greg, if you'd like to kick it off. Good morning. I think it's always interesting that people find themselves in the back of the room. Sometimes I'm tempted to pick up and move to the back room and ask everybody to turn around and we'll, we'll start from there. So I'll just come out to you, but I've been told not to go any further than this handsome gentleman behind this camera. So I won't uh, proceed any further than this, although I did take the time to introduce myself to Joy and Carol and uh, wish that we had the time so that I could meet each of you who are here this morning and learn a little bit more about your backgrounds. As was mentioned, my wife Lisa and I had the privilege of founding Christian Heritage, and when we talk with folks, we like to ask the question, what is your passion? Why do you do what you're doing? And does your passion relate to the work that you're currently doing today? And I can share with you with all candor that our passion is children. As a matter of fact, this photograph represents a little two-year-old girl, blonde-haired, blue-eyed, curly hair. We were having a board meeting at the lower level of one of our office buildings in central Nebraska. I came upstairs, and here was this beautiful little girl. She looked at me and then ran to her foster mother. I sometimes have that kind of an impact on kids, but <clears throat> one of the staff members made their way over to me and said, she's just been removed from her family because of abuse. Her parents were using drugs, and so she was removed from the family. She was placed with us at Christian Heritage, and then we were able to assist in getting her placed with her grandmother. This is just one of the children that we have an opportunity to serve on a daily basis. And as was mentioned, we're currently serving over 130 kids, and most of them are placed in traditional foster families throughout communities in Nebraska. I want to share with you briefly what our vision and mission statement is and how that ties into our work in corrections. Our vision is families restored. And so that's what we're really all about in terms of our work with corrections, to restore families, to enable those incarcerated dads to be reunited with their children, and to enable children to know that they have a dad who loves and cares about them. So it's families restored, children filled with hope, and prepared for life. And our mission statement is to improve the lives of children by equipping families, and a lot of that is done through the foster care work that we do, both with the foster families and the biological families. It's also to promote responsible fatherhood and to strengthen marriages. Why do we do that? Again, because we believe that every child, every child deserves to have a family. I wanted to show you just kind of briefly our history. Uh, we were incorporated in June of 1980 as this photograph of my wife Lisa holding a little girl. That's our daughter who's now 33 and has three children of her own. Our son is standing in front of her. He was quite small then. He's 35 now and has three kids. And these are two of our foster daughters who are now 47 and 48. I was behind the camera and believe me, I had much more hair then than I do today. That was a long time ago. This was one of the first children's homes that we opened in 1981. And we've since expanded into central Nebraska and built homes for kids and expanded into foster care. We did that in 1987 <laughs> so that the children who were living in our homes that could not be reunited with their own families would in fact have a family where they could live. 
And these are some photographs of homes where we serve children. <clears throat> In 2007, we became very deliberate about trying to ascertain, why does Nebraska have so many kids in our foster care system? You may be interested in knowing that Nebraska ranks consistently either first or second in the nation per capita in the number of children in our state's foster care system. And as we literally reviewed hundreds of cases of children that have been placed through us through the child welfare system, we determined that a major contributing factor is fatherlessness. And so we launched a fatherhood initiative in 2007, and we wanted to acknowledge those dads who are involved and engaged in their children's lives and who are doing great things for their kids. And so we started by hosting a Nebraska Father of the Year event. In June of each year, just before Father's Day, we acknowledge a special dad. We receive nominations through the month of April at www.fatheroftheyear.net. We have a council from across the state of Nebraska that reviews those essays. And then last year, this is a gentleman who won that award and received recognition from Nebraska's Lieutenant Governor Rick Sheehy. In 2008, after we had received a relatively small capacity building grant from the National Fatherhood Initiative, we held a leadership summit on fatherhood in Lincoln and invited 11 different sectors of the community, including local, state, and federal government representatives, Department of Health and Human Services, Corrections, the faith-based community, education. We invited folks from nonprofit organizations, philanthropy, et cetera, and we talked about what are we doing well for dads in our community and state, and where are their gaps? And when we started talking about gaps, people were saying, we really ought to be doing something more for teenage dads or providing legal services for those dads who are needing assistance there, or maybe new dads. And then there was a gentleman there I'd never met by the name of Larry Wayne. He raised his hand and he said, how about doing something for incarcerated dads? I really wasn't very interested in and yet, as we continued to have follow-up meetings, Larry kept coming. And he kept saying, won't you do something for the dads who are incarcerated? We mentioned that Christian Heritage is a faith-based ministry. And so I took time to actually go to a Christian retreat center, and I took my Bible with me. And it seemed like whether I was reading in the Old Testament or the New, there was scripture after scripture about those who were imprisoned. And when I came to Hebrews 13.3 that says, consider those who are incarcerated as though you were there yourself, I got the point. So I came back and I said to Larry, Larry, what exactly would you like for us to do? And he said, Greg, um, I really would like it if you would teach our dads how to be better dads. And so we held a training. We contacted our friends at the National Fatherhood Initiative and said, would you come to Nebraska? And when they came to Nebraska, they were willing to train both folks from the Department of Corrections and volunteers to facilitate Inside Out Dad. Larry brought 20 of his staff members to Christian Heritage. We recruited 20 volunteers. And so there were actually a total of 40 people who were at this training so that they could go inside correctional facilities and teach dads how to be better dads. Well, after these folks were trained, we began to put together a staff. We were honored after we received a Second Chance Act grant to have Sadia Abdullah and to have uh, Margaret from the Vera Institute select Christian Heritage as a visitation site and come and spend time in Nebraska. We gathered our team together and were actually took some of the folks inside the correctional facility so that Margaret could spend some time talking with and gaining input from the dads. The program that we launched is called Destination Dad, and we've put a pamphlet on your uh, table so that you could look at that and see what our programs are about. And those <coughs> pamphlets are intended for the dads. It's their invitation to join this program. And inside that, it talks about each of the different components. 
And the starting place, the starting point, is Inside Out Dad. And I want you to know that as far as the Inside Out Dad classes are concerned, that we have had 600 dads successfully complete this program. But the thing that we're most excited about is the fact that those 600 dads represent 1,379 children. Now to us, that is really exciting. And as we were working with these dads, we realized that we needed to be able to do something to help them connect better with their kids because a lot of the relationships are strained or broken. We have a number of dads who say to us, I don't have a relationship with my kids. I haven't seen them in years. They're better off without me. And we say, no, no, they're not. Because studies show that when your kids grow up without you, that they are at much higher risk of dropping out of school, of entering gangs, of your daughters becoming pregnant, and of your sons following you into the juvenile justice and into the correctional system. Your kids need you, and they need to know that you care about them. So we began to work on trying to deter determine how to connect dads with their kids. And one of the things that we learned is that there is a woman from Virginia who had been incarcerated and had two sons. When she got out, she took her videography background and began to videotape, going back inside, videotaping parents giving messages to their kids reading books and communicating with their kids and then sending those DVDs. And so we contacted her and said, would you come to Nebraska? Would you teach us how to do this? And she was willing to do that. And now we go inside correctional facilities and we would ask a donor to give us the money so that we could buy video equipment. We borrowed lighting equipment to start with and we go in and videotape them. We've had families and children gather books and bring them to us so that we can take books so that they can select a book and read it to their children. There's a little four-year-old girl who recently received one of those DVDs. And we heard from her grandmother that her grandma said, I have a DVD for you to watch tonight. So she crawled up on the sofa and her mother handed her a book. Her grandmother handed her the book and put the DVD in of her dad. And when this little girl saw her daddy on the television, she hopped down off the sofa and ran around to the back of the television to see if her daddy was there. We have stories of kids that don't want to go to bed at night until their dad reads to them, or that don't want to go to school in the morning until they can see their dad again. We actually receive letters from people telling us just how much this means to us, to their kids, and to thank us for helping to keep their kids connected to their dads. Well, some of the other things that we've done is we then provide for these dads who've gone through the Inside Out Dad program a monthly follow-up course so that they can continue to come and learn more about the importance of being a dad. And we provide additional topics that they identify as being important to them. So monthly follow-ups is something that's very important. And when United States Attorney General Eric Holder was here, he talked about the importance of maintaining family relationships. And boy, we see that that is absolutely essential in the lives of these kids. And so that's what this DVD from Dad is about. We have recorded 200 DVDs, 220 DVDs for 325 kids. Another thing that we thought was important was to actually enable kids to come in and see their dads. So we went to see our friend, Larry Wayne, at the Department of Corrections and said, Larry, would it be possible? I, I, we understand that the kids come in to see on their, their parents during visitation hours, but that's really not a time when a kid can really connect with their dad. Would you give us another time when kids could come in just to play with their dad? And we have such a relationship with Larry that he said, yeah, yeah, I think we can do that. And we have children who just so look forward to that once a month, two hours, to go inside and spend time with their dads. They move the chairs out of the way. We have toys that we've gathered. 
mats that we put down on the floor, and dads get down on the floor and just play with their kids. And our staff members are the ones who go and supervise. It's really a wonderful opportunity for these dads and their kids. And then while the dads are playing with their kids, we take the moms to another location and just talk to them. How are things going for you? Is there something we can do to help you? We've had moms say, I need a job so we can help them gain employment. Others have said, it's Christmas time and we have no gifts for our kids. And we've been able to help with that. And another mother was simply concerned that they live on a second story of an apartment building and the stairs were broken leading up to their apartment. And she was concerned that her children were gonna fall through the stairs. And so we were able to help to be sure that the children were safe at the apartment building. We've also expanded and are providing relationship classes to youth at a local detention center. 254 children have gone through that. We're also recruiting and providing mentors for dads. These are things that are absolutely important to help these guys reconnect with their families once they're released from the correctional facilities. There are just so many other things I'd like to share with you, and I know that time is short, but I'd like you to know that one of the things that we have realized is that there's more yet that can be done. And when we talk to the dads and ask them, how can we help you connect with your kids, one of the things that they said to us is, Greg, if we could just have more time, we get 15 minutes a day on the telephone. If we could just have a little more time. And as we met with the moms, they were saying the same thing. How can we, how can we communicate with our husbands, with our kids, and understand all that's going on with them and allow them time to visit with their kids if they just get 15 minutes a day? So we went back to our friend, Larry Wayne, and said, could you give these guys who are involved in our program more time? And he said, yes. And so those guys who participate successfully or are involved in our programming get twice that amount of time, 30 minutes a day. And also we're working on putting together a family plan so that their wives, girlfriends, or parents can come into the facilities before they're released to put together a plan. And the last thing that Larry approved, which we really appreciate, we just think, if a dad's involved in a kid's life, wouldn't he be there for parent-teacher conferences? So we asked for permission to get Skype so that dads could actually attend parent-teacher conferences via Skype. And that's something that we're going to be initiating soon. And we're absolutely thrilled that Larry and the Nebraska Department of Correctional Services would approve that. The last thing I want to say is just how honored we were in 2010 when Larry nominated us for the Partnership Award with the Nebraska Department of Correctional Services. And we received an award from the Director of the Department of Corrections, Robert Housden, and Nebraska's Governor, Dave Heinem. And I just want you to know that I just put up a few things here that we've learned over the course of the last three years. And that is the importance of building relationships, whether it's with people at the very top within the Department of Correctional Services or moving on down the ladder, so to speak, building of relationships <coughs> is absolutely essential. And then there's some other things that we've taken away. The importance of starting slow. Really, for the first, practically the first two years, all we did is provide inside out dad. And then as we were doing that, we began to realize that there's so much more work that needed to be done to help these dads connect with their kids. And so things have expanded from there. But I think if we'd gone into corrections and said we want to do all these things, we would have overwhelmed them and they probably would have been less receptive to allowing us to do what we're doing today. So, um, one of the things that's up here is cooperate. Um, when we go into a correctional facility, they don't, they don't always have the correct data in regards to who's coming on what day. And they'll sometimes say to our people, no, you can't get in today. And we share with our staff, there's only one, there is only one response to that. And that response is, okay. We, we don't allow our staff, we train our volunteers. You don't argue. We treat them with respect. Whether we're visiting with Deputy Director Larry Wayne, or we're visiting with a correctional officer at the front desk, we treat them with respect. And, if, and we just think that that's so important that that's one of the things that we wanna share with people. We also open up our trainings to people with the Department of Corrections and, and oftentimes have them come to trainings that Christian Heritage is conducting.
follow through on promises is an important thing. And we oftentimes provide services without compensation. These are just some other suggestions. We're now holding an annual meeting and inviting people from the Department of Corrections to give them an update in regards to what's happening. And they really enjoy coming and they've asked us to continue to do this so that they can fellowship and also learn more about what Christian Heritage is doing. It's been a great experience to work with them and I wish we could just sit down and share more information back and forth. But we're extremely grateful for the relationship that we have with Corrections for the opportunity to be in men and women's facilities because we know that it's providing great hope for Nebraska's kids. And again, that's what we're all about. Thank you. Good morning. Um, my name's Larry Wayne and uh, I'm deputy director for uh, programs and community services with the uh, Department of Correctional Services. As uh, Roger pointed out in my bio, it's really the only job I've ever had. I started there right out of college in, in the mid-70s and have stayed pretty much with the same employer since then. Um, one of the things I did was uh, working my way up. I spent 11 years as warden at one of our women's facilities. Women, incar incarcerated women in, in the United States and in Nebraska um, are going to be getting out. Most of them are doing shorter sentences. Most of them are mothers. And most of them are going to be, 90% in fact, were going to be the primary caregivers for those ch their children when they come out of prison, which was not necessarily my experience growing up working in one of the men's facilities. Um, we do great things in Nebraska for women offenders because we get it and, and recognize the, those realities suggest that if uh, incarcerated mothers are going to be successful when they get out, we should have programming that addresses that reality and helps them be successful. Uh, when I transferred in 1999 to become warden at one of the men's facilities, I said, well, why, you know, and, and, and I encountered incarcerated men who had not lost the right for visitation. There, there are guys in prison, we all know, that, that should not have contact with their kids. They've hurt their kids. They've hurt some kid or their own kids, and they're there for that. But there's a bigger percentage that haven't done that, that, that haven't forfeited their rights to visitation and so forth, uh, legally at least. As Greg mentioned, they've done it emotionally and checked out because they haven't been good fathers. And uh, what we want to do in this morning in kind of starting at a micro level in one state, one program and, and how that partnership build, um, we'll get into how, how that looks uh, systemically more later on. But um, I did approach Greg when I met him and said, you know, knowing what we did with the women offenders and how successful it was. Um, I, I asked him about replicating that success with male uh, offenders, incarcerated fathers. Um, and as he already mentioned, he was receptive to that. The things I want to visit with you briefly about are how you build a good partnership. I'm glad there's folks here this morning from uh, the community who are service providers. And I'm glad there's folks here from state and federal and, and local facilities because my remarks are really going to be to both all of you, both of you uh, groups. Um, first of all, as, as, a, as a prison administrator and a former warden, le let me remind you of what a lot of you already know, and that is that uh, we really love our schedules. We operate on control schedules and things going off on time are very, very big to us. Uh, a, a good you know, day is when all the meals get served on time. The inmates like it that way. Uh, the staff like it that way. And, and, and so there's a tendency sometimes to view outside people coming in to deliver programming as folks who are potentially going to disrupt that schedule. That, that, that almighty precious schedule we hold up. And, and 
I've already mentioned there's reasons for that, good reasons. But here's, here's the thing that I would say that I learned as a prison administrator that, that I would share with you is that no matter how good your security is, no matter how tight your, your facility operations are, if, if you are in good shape there and you have solid programming, either provided by your own staff or, and or folks from the community coming in to engage, guess what? You're going to have better security and tighter prison operations because you're going to have if the programming is effective and really gets after the needs of the folks you have under your supervision, they're going to be highly engaged. They're going to be highly involved. They're not going to just be cooperative and compliant, which on a great day you hope you get. They're going to be committed to the change that the program is trying to bring about. If, if there's high levels of efficacy in that program, those folks are involved. They are not out on the yard gambling, pressuring, engaging in predatory behaviors. They are taking care of business of changing their lives. They're changing their thinking. And if they change their thinking, what follows? Their behavior. And if that behavior follows, you change an entire prison culture. And suddenly your job looks a whole lot less different and a whole lot less difficult. Not less challenging because the business of bringing about thinking change is huge. But um, one of the things Christian Heritage did, by, for example, that made that, that, that fit work way, way better was, as Greg mentioned uh, on, on one of his last um, uh, slides for PowerPoint, is they came in with an idea that they were going to be respectful of our prison institutional needs for schedules, control, whatever. I mean, we had to have that, and, and Greg got it right from the get-go. He got it to the extent that um, because we're faced with budgetary constraints, I know that's a common theme throughout the country, when I said, you know, it would be easier or less difficult for us to accommodate the programming that we really need and, and that we would really like you to bring in that I'm actually asking you for, if one of your staff, if there's time, would become trained and go through our pre-service that a correctional officer gets or any new, new hire gets and, and take the portions of that training, the components that would allow him to deliver classes without having to have a staff presence there without having you know pull up an extra person in on overtime and have them actually sit there and babysit the class well one of Greg's trainers one of the real heroes of the program who's not here who should be is uh, a guy named Jim Irwin who's a former police officer and and now works full-time with Christian Heritage and, and Jim said yeah I'll do that and, and so he went through about three to four weeks of training and was able to carry a radio, carry keys, and train other volunteers so that the cost of the department in terms of time, staff, resources was very minimal. And it spoke volumes once again to Christian Heritage's commitment to get the programming in and make it easier for us to accept their help. I know that sounds ridiculous to say, but, but we, as I said earlier, tend to sometimes be kind of closed to outsiders. And, and there's reasons for that. Um, some, some, not every experience I've had in Nebraska, and it's probably some of you have had, has been wonderful with volunteers. Some of them have boundary issues. Someone question and argue about rules, and, and you really <coughs> want them to be kind of, quote, on the same side with you. We're all for um, delivering, you know, a program and, and having an environment that is conducive to change. And so that, that's what... Uh, Christian Heritage did that made it easier for us to have them help us. And, and that's frankly, you'll hear over and over again from prison administrators who want and believe that, that outside community-based involvement uh, from civic and, and, and faith groups is, is hugely important to the success of, of reentry and helping, you know, incarcerated men and women be successful in prison and especially after they get out of prison is having that community presence ha having that handshake and that that's still something we struggle with sometime in our institutions 
Uh, historically, we kind of operated like I did in the 70s. When, when that person got up to leave, uh, we said, well, our involvement, our interest, our obligation pretty much ends when you walk out the door. And that's the great thing that's changed in the last few years in uh, criminal justice throughout our country is that we, we understand that, and, and so does Christian heritage. Um, I learned from my work with Christian Heritage uh, a staggering statistic. And um, it was published by the National Fatherhood Initiative, who uh, underwrote and supported the work uh, with us, the partnership. And it was an article entitled The Hundred Billion Dollar Man. And the hundred dollar, hundred billion dollar man in the United States represents the cost of absentee fathers, father, fatherlessness in American homes. And, and it looks like all of the kinds of problems that are more likely to occur with uh, children where dads are present, or excuse me, are not present in the home having at-risk behaviors, having a greater likelihood to engage with the law enforcement community, uh, not in a good way, have criminal justice contacts, greater likelihood for teen pregnancy, greater likelihood to drop out, greater likelihood of delinquency, um, greater likelihood of falling, unfortunately, in the steps of their parents when one or both has been incarcerated a 70% greater likelihood that the children of incarcerated parents will themselves become clients of the criminal justice system. That adds up between that and public assistance and the children these children, ha these, these adolescent kids have, uh, the public assistance their mothers require, that is more than $100 billion. The article was about four or five years ago, I'm sure, given the cost of things, it's, it's, it's way more than $100 billion. But it, it just staggered me to, to think of that. Um, I am going to keep my remarks short, but uh, um, I do appreciate you know, the opportunity to visit with you. And I hope that uh, when we're done, if you have questions or comments uh, as we go from kind of now the, the micro view of effective prison community partnerships to the macro view, uh, that you um, please feel free to bring them forward. Thanks very much. Hi, good morning, everybody. How are you? Good. Thank you so much, Greg and Larry, for uh, the great presentation that you did. Uh, actually, was scribbling some notes now on things that I uh, learned from that. So thanks to both of you. Uh, my name is Jack Charlier, and I'm going to offer you a perspective from both ends. Uh, what do I mean by that? My background is in parole. I'm a gun and badge guy. Uh, my career in parole was in Illinois, so it's all community, uh, not on the prison side of things. And uh, in Illinois, my responsibilities uh, were for the metro Chicago area, so about 20,000 parolees, 16,000 of which were in Chicago, 4,000 of which were in the suburbs, uh, which were concentrated into about, the majority of those 20,000 concentrated into about six zip codes. Uh, I offer that to you so that when you think about where you are uh, geographically and where you're located and where your staff is working if you are interacting with the community, that you can understand that my comments are coming from that perspective. Um, I have a few things to say about rural areas. I am not an expert in that arena. Rural areas do present different challenges as well as opportunities in terms of partnerships within the community corrections arena. Uh, I should tell you actually one more thing then in terms of the work that we did. Um, I maintained uh, over 30 relationships within the Metro Chicago area that were unique to uh, the work we did in parole. What I mean by that is uh, they were organizations or groups primarily non-contractual, and I'm gonna talk, speak about that, the difference between con contracted partners or vendors uh, and those who are not, uh, and those who are not hopefully are the majority. So when I say 30 or more partnerships, it's really uh, partnerships with people who aren't receiving any money from the state or from government to do the work, the reentry or some aspect of it. So that's the one end that I said I'm gonna bring the perspective from, and uh, my uh, career at the state was approximately 18 years. 
Uh, the other end, though, and this is a question actually I want to ask you, is um, I have a very strong civic engagement background uh, in that as an American citizen, uh, I have been engaged actively in community and civic functions uh, for longer than my time in criminal justice, which is now over 20 years. And so I bring uh, that perspective to the table, and that very much informed how I did my community engagement on the parole side. And so it's kind of interesting, because when I would sit across the table from true community partners, civically, uh, or civic organizations, or or social service organizations, I sat in their spot many times. During the time that I was even working with the state, I would engage in civic functions and would be sitting across from elected officials or partners and uh, you know, could see both ends of kind of how relationships to develop. So I offer that to you, and let me ask you, and this is not meant to embarrass anybody, just helps me understand, how many of you have, and I'll just say good, extensive, whatever you want to call it, uh, civic engagement backgrounds of your own unrelated to work. I'm just curious, uh, how many of you are civically involved? It doesn't matter if you don't raise your hand. Okay, a, f a few are, okay. I would offer you that uh, if that's something that you are doing, kind of those are good lessons learned, even though they seem, you, know, you cross into the professional world, they're great lessons learned because you can get that perspective. And if you're not, uh, you may want to find and seek out staff who are civically engaged because they may give you tremendous insights that no matter how many books or s lectures like this you come to or discussions, uh, you can glean from them. So with that said, as an opening, uh, I'm going to just actually cut to the chase. I'm tend to be pretty brief when I speak, and I'm going to offer you uh, five things that I think are very relevant to forming partnerships between government uh, and community. And by community, I mean the whole range of uh, contractor relationships, which again, are, may or may not be called partnerships, uh, but more importantly, to kind of that middle ground uh, and all the way to civic organizations. And then at the end, I'm going to offer you one thing to do when you get back to uh, work on uh, what today is Thursday, when you get back to work on Friday, I guess, because we're all going back to work on Friday, right? Not on Monday. Um, so the first lesson learned is understand who you are partnering with. Uh, it seems to be kind of a real obvious one, um, but it can get very complicated, as you know. And what I did was I uh, eventually, over time, both from the civic side as well as uh, when I was doing it from the parole side, is I kind of broke it down into three different levels, right? I created a model. And I said, there's three tiers of people that I'm going to end up partnering with. Uh, one of which, and the, the numbers mean nothing, but tier one were my contractual and my vendor people, right? And so when I wanted to partner with them, uh, I understood and knew that I had leverage over them. I didn't really count them as partnerships per se, even though they were in the sense that they were coming alongside us to do work. Uh, but the reality was those tier one kind of relationships uh, are very different than the next two. Uh, tier two are people who partner with you in your work, your offender reentry work, your fatherhood initiative, uh, whatever it may be, provision of treatment, mental health services, whatever it may be, uh, have mission alignment with you, uh, but probably aren't getting paid by you or receive uh, any kind of funding. That doesn't mean they don't receive funding from government, um, but they're partnering with you in the work you do. And uh, they hopefully comprise a good amount of the relationships you have. But understanding that uh, these are people who have mission alignment with you, or at least whose mission seems to overlap with you, is important because that helps you kind of navigate the waters, which we'll talk about on some of the points I'm going to mention. And then finally uh, were the tier three relationships, and those were the community, civic, and sometimes faith-based relationships and employers. These tier one, tier two, and tier three um, are not always mutually exclusive, right? You can have a partner in tier one that you're contracted with, and they obviously may also have mission alignment with you, and you hope that they do in some way, shape, or form. The tier two and tier three, those who have mission alignment, and then those who are just from the community, civic, or faith arena, uh, those ones are a little bit trickier uh, to navigate. So, but the first thing is question to ask yourself is uh, who are you partnering with? And let me ask you a question here. Know that I've given you these three tiers. First time you've heard it. Um, how many of you uh, partner with uh, tier two, which are people that you have mission alignment with, but we'll say in large measure. Maybe you give them a small amount of money for a staff member or a car. Ignore that uh, for this. How many of you have tier two partners in the work that you do? Okay, good. How many of you have tier three? And let me make clear, uh, clear on tier three. These are community, civic, uh, sometimes faith-based organizations. 
they really may not have mission alignment with you, but they're doing some work in an area that overlaps where you are, but otherwise your two ships probably wouldn't pass in the night. And it may be by chance, as you heard the story of Larry and Greg and how they met, and that's a very common scenario with Tier 3 uh, relationships. And again, what I call Tier 3. How many of you have Tier 3 relationships? Good, excellent, very good, very good. Um, so that's the first thing is who are you partnering with and again I'm going to go through this quickly uh, there's detail to this I will be skipping it uh, but that's the first starting point uh, because that helps you understand what that relationship is going to look like that takes me to the second uh, lesson learned and that is um, what is their intent why is it that they are sitting here with you or that they're responding to an email or giving you a phone call or you're giving them a phone call? What is their intent? And you can see then from the simple model that I developed, a tier one, tier two, tier three, um, understanding their intent uh, varies depending on what tier they're in, right? Um, and the implication then for you, if you're kind of in the driver's seat, is to know, am I in fact in the driver's seat? Can I influence or impact their intent in any way? So if I have a tier one relationship, and again, these numbers are just, you know, they just are what they are. It could be A, B, and C. Um, I had tremendous influence over our contractors in terms of the work that they did and how they did it and how they partnered with us. Those are oddly, uh, or those are the easier ones, not easiest, but easier ones. Uh, when you get down to tier two, you hopefully have some influence, but they also have influence over you at that point. And so in terms of the relationship that you're going to develop, um, you should recognize that. And I think it was Larry and Greg, actually both of them spoke to that, to the need to understand how this relationship develops. And if you're in a tier two relationship with someone, uh, you're going to have to give to get. Uh, and it seems really simple, but we're from government and we're here to help. And so therefore we come in with our program and our established kind of set of ideas, but to the tier two person, they can take or leave working with you. Uh, they can take or leave it and because they, they can go somewhere else and possibly do what they want to do. And then when you think about tier three relationships and what is their intent and what is your in ability to influence their intent, now you're kind of in this real loose arena where the word partnership may or may not fit. It may be more some type of cooperation, maybe a collaboration around some type of activity that you are looking to uh, engage in. Uh, from the civic standpoint, uh, I mentioned up front that uh, there are about six communities. I think I said six zip codes. That's probably uh, a little looser. It should say six communities. And in those communities were civic organizations, groups of citizens who banded together for uh, uh, community safety, for making sure their neighborhood is clean, uh, for making sure that kids are where they're supposed to be, uh, all that good stuff that goes on kind of in the civic arena. And when you talk about a tier three relationship with organizations like like that, uh, it looks very, very different because they just want to know why are you in our neighborhood? What's going on? Um, what is it that we can do to help you? But if you, if it's not something that you're willing to share with us, then maybe we don't help you in return. And that's a very different relationship than a tier two or tier one, uh, where uh, you don't have necessarily kind of leverage over them. So understanding who you're partnering with then goes to what is their intent and what is your intent. And of course, to understand that, you can ask questions. Well, what is your interest in working with parolees? Why do you want to work with female offenders? Uh, what is your interest in wanting to know who, uh, who has kids and who does not have kids who's out in the community? And they're going to ask you uh, questions such as, and these are mostly came from tier three, um, will you be arresting the people that we're going to work with? When are you going to be drug testing people? Why do you come into homes uh, at late hours or early hours? Why do you do that? I thought we had a relationship and you would respect us. Why do your officers come over to my building and ask us about where people are? Those are the kind of things that uh, very much inform what the relationship can look like going forward. Next lesson learned is the time perspective. The time perspective. Um, when we in government have things that we want to do, we do our planning, and, so, and sometimes, more often, uh, maybe in, in your jurisdiction and others, uh, that time perspective uh, is critical because you will unleash or unfold into the community a plan. But the community is not ready for that plan. They may or may not have been involved in it, uh, but if they were involved in it, it probably was a few select partners. And so the uh, question of time perspective is when you're ready to go out to the community to partner and to have these relationships, uh, is your community ready? Have you sufficiently involved them in a wide enough cut across the civic, community, faith, employer uh, base 
so that they're not surprised by anything that you're doing in terms of work that you want to do in your community. The time perspective uh, also says, well, if I partner with someone, can this organization keep it up over the long run? And when you think of tier two and tier three organizations, ones that have mission alignment with you, which is tier two or tier three, the true civic community, uh, faith-based organizations, they may not have the ability to go the distance, whereas you do. You're operating on state funds or federal funds, and you've got funding, as far as you know, until whenever. Or you're on a three-year grant, so you've got funding for five positions for three years. But when you partner with people, it's very important to know how far can they go, how far down the road with you can they go. So if you have a great program that's providing service to 15 women who are survivors of domestic violence and who also happen to be offenders, because we know that tremendous tie between the female offender population and uh, the amount of trauma and sexual and physical uh, uh, violence that they have gone through. Uh, but they can only go one year, and you have a three-year initiative out there. What does that look like for the relationship? So what does the time perspective look like uh, for you as you approach uh, the community? And then the final item is capacity. And this is kind of uh, like a corollary to the time perspective, and that is, as you engage in your partnerships, and really your tier two and your tier three partnerships, what capacity does that organization bring to you? Um, so I remember working with an organization that did some great work around women uh, who had been involved or were involved in uh, prostitution. Um, in terms of engaging the relationship, it took about three to four months to get to the point where the executive director and myself uh, were able to sit down and have a conversation about our officers sharing some information with them and them sharing some information with us, which is a big no-no kind of in the domestic violence world. Everything is kept correctly uh, and in the sexual assault world kept very tight for very good reason uh, from the kind of the advocacy side. Um, but what I came to learn is that their capacity uh, with us was going to be one case manager and maybe three, four people. So the question always is in terms of you developing your relationships uh, from the government perspective out back to the community is what is their capacity and is that relationship worth it to you or not from a capacity standpoint. And that's kind of cold and hard in one way, uh, but there's a reality to how much time you have to engage in relationships and to develop them. Um, when they're tier two, tier three, remember you have almost no control over them or limited influence down to none. And so you may have a variety of people, organizations within which or with which you can partner. And the question is, which ones are you going to choose? So I offer those five items to you as uh, lessons learned. And again, uh, wanting to be very respectful of time. I won't offer context. We'll probably get into that into some of our discussions. Uh, but I leave you with just this one item, and that's this. Tomorrow when you get back to work, uh, because we're all going back to work tomorrow after a conference, we want to get in, check our emails, and respond to everything before the long weekend. Um, if you do not do this, I would offer it to you as a best practice, which means that there's no research on it, but I found that it, it increased substantially in a multiplier of three to five the number of tier two and tier three relationships that we had with parole prior to doing this. And it was a very simple thing. Um, I mandated, I, I mandated, that's right. <laughs> I'm not supposed to say we mandate things. I mandated our line officers to go out and once a month report back at their monthly supervisor meeting uh, one new partner that they had found. And then at the monthly supervisor meetings for the region, I mandate, mandated them to stand up and report, or you know, we do it in some informal way at the meeting and say, here's a new partner I found. And this I said, now don't open up the phone book or go on the internet and just give me a name and address. I get that, I can do that. Tell me who you went and met with. So. At the meetings, they'd say, I went and met with Jack Charlier, and Jack is, and I'm a veteran, uh, works with uh, veterans who are returning, uh, re-entering from prison. And we talked about X. Sit down, thank you, next. Um, we went to a three to five increase in terms of partners we had. Now I get that there's a head counting number to that, I get all that, without getting into it, uh, when we did our community engagement meetings, which are these kind of larger meetings, uh, primarily focused on tier two and tier three um, organizations around that model uh, that I developed. Uh, you know, we went from over a, about a four to five year period having a few people there to standing room only with 60 chairs to finding employers, uh, chambers of commerce, 
real estate organizations uh, that started showing up because the owner was an ex-offender or because they had a daughter who was addicted or an aunt who had been in prison. And all these were found, they're almost all tier three, and they were all found from the officers and the supervisors going out and saying, who are you? What do you do? Here's what I do. You think we can do something? And word spreads. And I know it's simple. I know it's a real kind of easy, you know, wow, what a goofy idea that is. It's so ridiculously simple. But from my civic side, I can tell you there's loads of people out there who have some way, shape, or form an interest in the world of criminal justice. Some of it good, some of it not. Um, and to find them is really just a matter of sending your staff out into the community arena, get away from your contracted partners. And what I mean by that is just don't look at it from that perspective. Uh, go to your community meetings, go to your civic meetings, go to your police beat meetings, go to your park district meetings, and you will find them. They are out there, and you will see an increase in terms of the people that bring resources to bear for you and that you are also helping them in some way, shape, or form. So I leave you with that as a uh, to-do. Thank you. I'd like to make four quick points that either summarize or, or reemphasize what uh, Greg, Larry, and, and Jack have said. First one, um, Shannon, I know that... Um, the PowerPoints are on the thumb drives that were distributed, but Greg added two or three slides to his today that I think are just exceptionally important. And if there's some way that we can get the last two or three slides of his PowerPoint distributed, I think that would be really helpful to folks. Uh, in my role, I, I was, the contract guy for my state agency. And um, in addition to, to doing a lot of policies, negotiated most of the contracts and grant arrangements that we had. And one of the things that I like to emphasize with people was something that I picked up, and I, I can't take credit for this, I don't know who the author of it was, but it was a simple statement that when the purpose of the work is unclear, the work becomes more important than the outcome. And I think it's very important that we stay focused on the outcome. And oftentimes, our purpose in getting into the relationship may be very different. Uh, when I talked with state age, or uh, with faith-based agencies, I made it very clear that my role as the corrections department was not to bring people to God. Um, my role was to um, make communities safer. And I didn't care whether they found religion or not. But if finding God was the way that they were able to change their behavior, I was all for it and supportive. And so we needed to find that common purpose that we shared and that common outcome that we were striving for. And that removed a great deal of conflict from the relationship and made the negotiations much easier. Third point, um, expectations for the Second Chance Act. I think this is something that um, applies to both the governmental side of the relationship and the community partner side of the relationship. The funding for the Second Chance Act is not to help any of us do what we're already doing. It's to cut recidivism. That's the expectation that is coming from Congress and the link is that by cutting recidivism we will make our community safer because lots of the cit most citizens don't know what recidivism is and, and could care less about it. They want to be safe. So the focus is that we are expected to cut recidivism and make our community safer and that the funds that we get through the Second Chance Act are really to help us inform ourselves on how we'll do it and how we'll spend our money, our state's money, our agency's money, 
to continue this work into the future. It's not a sustaining set of resources. And the last thing is, is a, um, an observation that I think all three of, of our panelists made, but it bears repeating, and that's beware of assumptions about the other partner's behavior and the reasons behind it. So learn your partner's culture, learn about their thinking, their motives, their goals, and their aspirations. And a lot of the things that get in the way of productive relationships will fall to the side. What we'd like to do with the balance of our time is hear from you, whether it's observations that you would like to make, questions that you have, problems that the group might be able to, to help you brainstorm and resolve. Um, that's how we'd like to spend the balance of our time. And because we're being recorded, we would ask you, there's a, a microphone on the table back there, we would ask you if you'd like to make a comment or raise a question, uh, please grab the microphone so that we can get that recorded and we'd love to spend some time talking with you. Um, good morning. Good morning. Uh, my name is uh, Reverend Q English. This is Reverend Tim English. We're from the Bronx, New York. Um, I have a couple of questions. One, um, you know, they, you know, we talk about recidivism reduction, but to find accurate data is has been quite challenging. You know, particularly in the juvenile area, is there uh, an accurate source? And I know they measure recidivism in different ways, even for capturing the actual recidivism, recidivism rate by borough. Like we're from the Bronx, Bronx, New York. Is there? a real place that you can get real data because there's so many conflicting reports. That's first. Are you uh, working with adults or juveniles? Both. Both. We actually are the Bronx Clergy Criminal Justice Roundtable, so it's like a whole collection of a bunch of faith leaders, and we yeah. all work with the whole population. I was hoping we'd start with an easier question. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's one that... Uh, I can tell you state agencies and um, large municipal agencies have been struggling with. You made the observation that there's no uniform uh, definition of recidivism. The Association of State Correctional Administrators has tried to develop uh, a standard definition of recidivism so that we could compare across state agencies. So the definition exists. Mm. The problem is that it probably at least half the states and major cities don't use it for a variety of reasons, mostly because of statutory requirements that they have within their respective jurisdictions. Um, I don't know who the head of uh, the New York City Department of Corrections is now, it was Marty Horn. Um, and I know that Marty has retired since then, but I would approach the New York City Department of Corrections as a starting, as one starting point. Yeah, they and uh, Brian Fisher. And I'm sorry? It's Fisher. Well, Brian is for the, is the uh, state, state right? director. Yeah. Uh, Maybe I'm misunderstanding. Are you working with state or with city offenders? Um, both. But okay. city is where predominantly what we're focusing on right God, now. You just keep making this harder and harder. I'm sorry. <laughs> I just, I'm really trying to determine, is yeah. there a source? I haven't really found it. I have found conflicting reports from 87% recidivism down to 40-something percent. Okay. You know, percent, uh, uh, let, so. me, uh, let me refer you to the Pew okay. uh, Center. Because they, they issued a report where they just went ahead and made some decisions, sometimes unilaterally, most of the time in conjunction with states, uh, in terms of stating recidivism rates. I would start with that. Okay. And then my second question, um, as it relates to faith base, mm -hmm. I know there's been some data on um, proving how spirituality plays a, a key role in... Um, offenders less likely to recidivate. Do you know where those reports can be found? 
I know. I remember a couple of years ago coming across it. Do you do you know where that data or that information can be found? I would guess that the uh, best source would be the National Institute of Corrections. You just Google uh, National Institute of Corrections uh, Information Center, and then put in your topic. And my guess is, if it's out there, they have it. Another thing on um, recidivism. Uh, as Roger was saying, the Bureau of Justice Statistics is kind of, kind of, along with the uh, state uh, correctional administrators, kind of written the uh, the Bible on uh, on how you compute certain things and what they look at in recidivism uh, generally, how they can uh, consider it is if there is a new felony incarceration within three years of when someone is released. Uh, that's considered a recidivist. And, and not every jurisdiction uses that, but, but most of the 50 states, and, and I think the Bureau of Prisons, the feds, uh, use that computation to uh, consider recidivism. I, wanted to, I want to just uh, throw one thing in related to um, a partnership. So again, in a general context, uh, your question, uh, Reverend, is a very good example. When I talked about kind of tier two, tier three partnerships and the fifth point I said of capacity. So when you're engaging in these partnerships, uh, does the partner have the capacity to do measurement work for you or for itself for the purpose of sustainability, right? Because now more and more when we talk about sustainability, you're going to have to show outcomes. Outcomes means measurement. It does mean uh, PhD uh, uh, research. It does mean some kind of measurement tool. And so when we do partnerships uh, and we talk about capacity, are you partnering with someone who has the capacity to show that their work jointly with you can get us funding, can get us to sustainability? Uh, if they can't, then you need to think through, and I offer this just as a suggestion, think through how will you then, if this partnership is meaningful to you because they bring other resources to the table, how will you assist them in terms of collecting data? So to your point, Reverend, and this is hypothetical, so forgive me, if you came to me and I saw that in, in, in my role in parole and I worked a lot with faith-based organizations, tier two, tier three, mission alignment or just ones that we kind of crossed in the night and realized we had an interest in each other, um, I would find out what was your ability to measure and if you didn't, I would open up our IT system, not to you, but to our supervisors working with you to kind of give us some feedback on how it's going on our parolees working with you. So if you're on the government side, consider as you partner with people, opening up your IT systems to have the ability to measure your impact partner by partner. It's sophisticated, it's slightly complicated, but if you want to have some sustainability, the ability to show the effect of your partnerships, specific, not in general, uh, that is a method by which to do it. One other quick comment, Reverend. Yeah. If you're unable to find the data you're looking for from where Larry suggested, you might check with the White House Faith-Based Initiative they might be able to direct you as well. So the, the number four was the time perspective. Uh, two and three, two was what is their intent, which is what Roger was talking about. Uh, what is your ability to influence their intent? That was number two. And number three, number four was the time perspective. Number five was capacity. And number one was uh, understanding who you're partnering with. So those are the kind of five parts of the model. You know, if that didn't make sense, see me afterwards. <laughs> I'm Dina Sakutris. I'm with Missouri Department of Corrections. I'm the reentry program manager there. And I'm interested to hear from Greg and Larry how the Skyping um, with the parenting conferences is funded. Christian Heritage will pick up entire the, the cost. Uh, we'll provide the computers. We'll provide the staff on the inside. We'll provide the staff going to the school, taking the equipment. We understand that the Department of Corrections is under severe stress as it relates to finances. And to a great extent, we're going to our donors and asking for their support. So uh, when we ask to be able to do something, we're not asking for money to do it. And did you do that as a pilot project in the beginning with one particular school and one particular institution? Yes. As a matter of fact, it's in the process of being launched. And, and we're actually starting by identifying a particular father who's doing daddy day visits with their um, son or daughter and utilizing them, then getting permission from the school to do that. 
and we, we're, we're calling it Parent Teachers Conference, but it's actually not held during the regular parent teacher conferences, obviously, because the teacher has to be able to be in their office uh, so that they can have the communication with the incarcerated dad. I mean, just in general, you know, you hear, you hear the story about that you hear one side of the story of where there are those that want to reduce recidivism and then the other side of the correction story where they don't give a flip about reducing recidivism for the sake of the monetary gain that comes from, you know, the prison system. So it feels like you can circumvent it to a degree, but then I don't know how deeply you can penetrate that you know, that power-hungry, money-hungry system that's prevailing, you know, at this time. So. Let me speak to that because I spent a lot of time talking with my peers about that specific issue. I think if you ask most um, state and federal corrections directors if they would like to grow or shrink their systems, the overwhelmingly um, common response would be they want to shrink their systems. Uh, our salaries didn't change based on whether we had uh, 80,000 inmates or 100,000 inmates in our system. In fact, in general, the jobs became more difficult if the uh, system grew. Now, on the other hand, there are entities that have an interest in seeing the prison population grow. Um, and this will be um, a controversial comment. This is purely mine. It's not CSGs or anybody else's. Um, if you look at the influence of private prisons in state and federal legislation, um, you will see that a number of those organizations are active uh, in promoting tough on crime legislation that increases prison length, prison sentence length, and prison sentence length increases prison population. Um, when I was secretary in my state, there was a movement to bring private prisons into the state. and. Private prisons in and of themselves are neither good nor bad. They're not better. They're not worse than, than state prisons. It's what you expect prisons to do. And um, from the private perspective, you grow your business by growing population. From a uh, public perspective, in general, things don't improve by having a larger population. And so there's always that tension going back and forth. There are also people in the correction system that do not believe that rehabilitation works. Um, and we have those folks in, in our system, in every system. And part of the discussion that we tried to have is back to this thing about when the purpose of the work is unclear, the work becomes more important than the outcome. We talked a lot about what's the point of what we're doing. And our job was to make Kansas safer. Everybody could agree on that. The disagreement was how do you do it? And so that's where we went back to the data, why your, your data question is so important. Because we were able to start showing that while we were reducing recidivism rates and driving down the prison population, we were also reducing reoffense rates. The, the new crimes committed that Larry was mentioning. And the argument then becomes, with the skeptics, why do you want to go back to a strategy where people reoffend more often? How does that make our state or our country safer? And, and you find that common ground, that common purpose that everybody can agree on. And then we started talking a, a lot with our skeptics about 
the role that they played in either improving those numbers and making the state safer or some of the behaviors that they engaged in that made things worse. And I tried to focus more often on the positive. You help make Kansas a safer state by providing a safe environment within the prison where this other recidivism reduction or risk reduction work can take place. Thank you for that. And by the way, when you start telling people that they're going to be back because they always come back, you're undermining the work. You're, you're making the state less safe. Now this is a gross oversimplification, but it's having those kinds of conversations. And frankly, those conversations need to be uh, going on between agency administrators and their staff as opposed to if you tried to do it, I think you'd, you'd be stepping on a landmine. Um, so, it, it, you know, there, you're never going to get win 100% of the folks and get everybody on board. Um, but I think, I, I'm not really sure what else to say. I, I really believe what I've told you is in the minds of most correctional administrators is accurate. And... Um, I think most of us do not want our our budgets to grow other than to be able to do a better job with hopefully fewer people in our system. In, in fact, in uh, Nebraska and most other states, um, correctional budgets have actually been cut in the last couple of years due to uh, budgetary constraints. Um, whereas the population may have increased, uh, we're being told, and understandably so, to do more with less. Any other questions or comments from folks? Uh, we have six minutes. Okay. Let me ask each of you, or let me ask you a question. It's more like a polling, if you don't mind, since we have a few minutes. Uh, how many of you work with adults, by the way? Okay, majority, a few, the rest are juvenile. And then how many of you are actually in community versus just facility-based? How many of you have reached into the community? Okay, so I'm going to ask you this, and by asking you this, it may open up uh, an avenue to thinking through some new partnerships for you. Um, how many of you have relationships, or your staff has relationships with the chambers of commerce in the communities in which they work? Okay, we need, so when I asked somebody had adults, a lot of hands went up, only about four hands went up there. Your chambers of commerce are full of people who do what? Employ people. And if you can show the value, if any individual can show a value to an employer unless they have some personal issue with hiring an ex-offender or there's some legal status, um, we know that they, they can hire them. Work is a work or getting work is also what? A criminogenic factor, right? So dealing with that. So if you don't have a relationship with Chamber of Commerce, I would offer to you, and I don't mean the chamber, there's probably multiple among the communities you have, that's a good place to be. Um, veterans organization, how many of you deal with any of veterans within your population? Okay, how many of your relationships with the American Legion, the VFW, IAVA? Okay, a, a few hands go up. Again, just throw that out to you. It's one of those that may not be as obvious. Um, and here's probably the one that's gonna get a lot of hands go up, uh, adult or juvenile. How many of you have uh, relationships non-contractual, so not tier one, with uh, faith-based, regardless of the faith-based uh, community? Okay, that, that's good. Well, I, I'm glad to see more hands. The reason is, is that generally my experience anecdotally has been at the faith-based community um, because they either have mission alignment tier two or they're doing some kind of work around criminal justice that they're very, very good resources and I was glad to see a few hands go up. So the Chamber of Commerce, the veterans organizations, and then get yourself thinking out of the box of who you normally associate with and don't think about them uh, from the standpoint of how you see them. Just approach them, that organization, because they may have an interest in you that you don't know about because no one's ever gone and sat down. And I know that's really obvious and I get that. I don't mean that to, to kind of say like I know something that you don't. We're all busy. We all have stuff to do. Uh, but there are dividends and resources to be dividends to be paid and resources to be found from approaching entities that the worst that happens is the car dealership says no. The best that happens is, and I'll, I'll end with this, is we found a lumber company completely unrelated to anything to do with criminal justice. Uh, and it turns out the gentleman's daughter had been involved in addiction. Never even involved in criminal justice, but had been involved in addiction and saw her friends end up in the criminal justice system and that afforded an opportunity for a relationship to be formed that 
uh, in the end got parolees hired into work at a good company that otherwise we never would have encountered. That was one of, and I could keep, I literally could go down the list and give you more examples like that. I'm sure you have some, but they're out there and I would just offer you know, a few more kind of avenues by which to go look for your partnerships. We will stick around for a few minutes in case anybody wants to come up for private conversation. Um, I would like to chat with you just a little bit longer because I don't think we gave you the best possible answer we could give you on the data issues. So I'd like to help you with that a little further. But thank you all very much. Thank you.